Okay. While we're doing that, uh, we're just going to do a hot sutra and coming up reading that. Well, we could just start. Over here, we're coming back to the next rally. Most of the group now is going to be a together with the great community of monks and the great community of monsters. The time the Bhagavan has explored the transportation. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avid Kadeshwar, very practice of the profound professional wisdom, who held both five practice policies and to his parentage, then to the power of the Dhamma. So the preacher said this to the Bodhisattva Arya Avid Kadeshwar. How should any son of the living strain be wishing to practice the activity of the profound perception of evil? Said that, and the Bodhisattva of Mahasattva Pai Avatthakutra said this to the Venerable Shri Avatthakutra. Avatthakutra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage, look the profound perception of wisdom. We look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five factors. Also, it's empty. One's empty. Emptiness is one. Emptiness is not of the control. Form is also not of the emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, oppositional factor is empty. Future, likewise, all phenomena are empty, without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient. Therefore, we have to ask if there is no soul, no feeling, emotion, no compositional factor, no consciousness, no no ear, no mind, no no body, no visual form, no sound, no light, no light, no light, no light, no light, no light, There is no regret, and it speaks in regret. So I'm not going to include it, no regret, and abstain from the regret. Similarly, there is no suffering for association of regret. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, no Here. Completely past beyond there, we reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled. So pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. Not to the perfection is the 
without that, I think that's the hard after the pose. So this to turn this one off, I assume. Which uh, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of the concentration. Maybe the Bodhisattva Mahasattva 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 Well said, well said, some words. It is like that. It is like that. We should practice the profound perfection of wisdom, just as you have indicated, even with the cognitive practice. Go surrounding the entirety along This is our first experience. I've been told that. People hugging trees. Someone who from heaven. What's is hard about Dharma is that someone has to get this The hard part is that it's by special ways of I said that things don't appear as they actually are, but I should have to approach that. And that's where the state comes up as well as, or also. Talking about uh, different tools, is these tools aren't really schools, but ways of thinking about the way that we talk about this and practice experience. 
description. Tells that I have to explain the In India, that were fundamentally affected, so to speak. In India, they weren't as interested in organizing things into political parties, so to speak. Individuals were very tax and students. There's no debate with them. School. For example, when Chandra Kirti um, was teaching writing in India, he didn't reach impact. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that he came into his own. It thousand years almost. The tantra can be stopped. This can be said. Make some sense. Yeah. It's not fun. You can't say. It's quite radical. However, when you look at our
philosophically, the story about pain psychologically. Um, for those of you who are experienced or meditators, don't What do we do when we have one had a good experience or so about someone else's experience or we convinced so of your compassion is given and any teachers they said, Well, we we could just kind of say nothing. Compassionately, we're going to try to say, well, um, we can work your present experience to things to do. That you're reading, you're not just trying to experience to themselves or meditation. The position is somewhat the same. Our characteristics That the fire fire could be water is no basis for the fear. So uh, just based on experience. Okay, it's also based on experience and attempt. Teaching others or teaching ourselves, we have to make decisions such as we have to make a Told that um, people um, can't have everything. You know what that is.
How about right now? Can anybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, they, it's picking up on my phone. So whatever the speaker is doing here, you, you're here, they're actually hearing me through my phone. Is there a, is there a way to increase that uh, volume? Loud and clear now. So if you want to, you're still on video here so people can see you, but they're hearing you through me. And you can tell you're talking because the transcript is going for you right there. Oh, good. Yeah. And Ellen said that it's clear now. Okay. So uh, let me see. Everything you said. I should have brought my um, pad with me, right? So I. Uh, I see Dirk and Jennifer, hi. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> uh, this chorus, had, which I'm calling the Buddha Dharma Study Chorus, um, is obviously very experiential, uh, even though I'm asking people to do papers and to think about things. Um, because uh, I want people to do the reading and then uh, go back and try it out, like in one's own experience. Uh, you know, what does it feel like? Does it feel like we're um, uh, seeing things accurately as they are with our ordinary consciousness? Does it feel like um, uh, naive realism, realism is true? You know, maybe. Uh, all we have to do is just notice ordinary, ordinary experience like the um, great exposition school, right? It's basically saying we just need to uh, pay attention to our ordinary experience and we'll see without um, much trouble when it's pointed out that um, things are impermanent, that this, uh, when we examine things and examine the skandhas, we'll see that uh, we can't find a, a, a self that's the same or separate Therefore, an Atman doesn't exist and so forth. That um, point of view is actually uh, put forward by uh, a number of uh, you know, Westerners too, and uh, Asians where, yeah, if you just point out the experience uh, 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 and uh, people will see it and meditation is useful to be calm and to um, not be emotionally upset, but that just by uh, noticing things with ordinary mind, uh, we can see things correctly. In fact, uh, a lot of the Zen schools like to say like ordinary mind, right? And there are Zen centers called ordinary mind and probably books called ordinary mind, right? <clears throat> it's just, we're not looking in the right place. So it's kind of like we've misplaced something like at home, I'm, I'm looking for <laughs> my keys and Sabrina says, well, you're looking in the wrong place, they're just over here. So when we're directed, we just see it. <clears throat> uh, however, uh, particularly in the Mahayana and Vajrayana um, uh, schools and from the standpoint of the Heart Sutra, uh, we're saying, you know, everything that you think you uh, know um, is wrong. <laughs> so uh, even when you think you know Dharma things, it's wrong. <clears throat> so we are saying that you do need to have a special kind of experience to verify the teachings and uh, look at it from that point of view. So that's why I suggest when people are reading these texts that um, you don't uh, read more than you meditate, right? So. Um, in my own personal practice, um, part of the morning and the evening is uh, I'm doing uh, my meditation, uh, whether it's shamatha or Mahamudra Dzogchen, then I'm reading um, in a formal way. 
and then I'm meditating after it. Does anybody else do it that way? Um, do you find um, that interesting and illuminates things? I do. Um, so it's interesting. I find some uh, uh, clarity uh, in the middle through uh, uh, reading and through thinking about things. And then when I come back to uh, non-intellectual meditation, then uh, things seem clearer. How does that happen? You know, what, what, what happens there? <clears throat> and if you had to explain what happens, then um, you would be uh, very much interested in these uh, philosophical presentations. <clears throat> so when you get up, uh, like right now, we could say, okay, maybe we're in ordinary consciousness, uh, talking and, and trying to figure out uh, our expensive video <laughs> uh, sound system. Uh, and uh, But if we did even a short uh, Shamta meditation, do you think your perception would change in some ways? I do find that it changes, you know, and it's quite um, humbling sometimes. But then when I study, uh, and I'm studying things that look kind of purely intellectual, such as, uh, you know, studying epistemology, how things appear logically, how things must be uh, logically, then when I uh, do uh, a non-analytical meditation uh, of a higher sort, like Mahamudra and Dzogchen, then uh, it helps clarify my experience. <clears throat> all the teachers I've studied with, all the great um, teachers have also um, uh, been very appreciative of the teachings and very appreciative of uh, debate and logic even if they're not uh, super logic logicians or super debaters, they're aware of the issues and they're aware of how the issues inform their experience and liberation. <clears throat> so I think it's uh, the essential thing is to have a real sense of struggle so that uh, in our own experience, um, we come to some kind of working ability to uh, appreciate uh, both uh, the radical prasangika view and the svatantrika view. So I probably very much like uh, the first abbot uh, came to um, Tibet, Santarakshita, uh, who invited um, Padmasambhava Guru Mshe, who um, uh, described it as a uh, Yogacara Satantika uh, Majimakan, you know, <laughs> like that. <laughs> so uh, uh, these terms don't make any sense, except maybe from personal experience that Santarakshita uh, said, you know, um, uh, there are uh, characteristics that uh, we used to distinguish one phenomena from another. However, these characteristics, uh, so that would be uh, a Svatantrika approach, right? Um, uh, and that the mind uh, puts together these characteristics forms um, uh, from the sense data and from the information forms a composite about the experience and that's a Sautrantika, right? That, that kind of conforms to uh, contemporary uh, neurobiology, right? That we put together a sense data and the mind uh, puts an image together, right? That, uh, you know, raw sense data doesn't see a table or a chair, but uh, uh, we bring something to it, right? And then finally, uh, Sandra uh, had a yoga chara viewpoint that um, phenomena still have to uh, be, uh, not separate from knowing, right? That uh, it doesn't make sense to talk about uh, unknown objects. Are we still hearing? Wave if we still can hear, okay. So, <clears throat> uh, 
So uh, I'm very fond of uh, Santarakshita, of course. Um, but uh, uh, this kind of, and Guru Ramche's approach also, um, but this kind of, uh, if I could use the term hybrid approach, um, uh, gradually over time in Tibet, uh, uh, didn't go away, but also um, somewhat gave way to uh, a different and more, um, you know, perhaps partisan or um, firm beliefs in uh, different styles, such as Lam Sankapa style and uh, various Nyingma and Kargyu styles. <coughs> uh, fortunately, um, there was what was called a uh, remade tradition, uh, the attempt to uh, once again uh, bring some harmony into uh, these different presentations and value the different um, experiential presentations. And fortunately with uh, the present Dalai Lama who's um, profoundly uh, looked into all the available uh, traditions that he's aware of, uh, and the very famous uh, speeches and um, texts. He said, well, I believe they all come to the same point. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, we're uh, left with a little different kind of uh, problem, usually uh, from a um, taking a side point of view, we want to decide what's right. Huh? We always want to be right from some level, don't we? Um, <clears throat> but uh, looking at it from a uh, perspective of uh, uh, some of the present great teachers who some of us have met, like Dalai Lama, Dutra Mimshe, and uh, Saiki and so forth, uh, we, we should be more interested in uh, how is it that they come to the same point and uh, how is it that uh, the different uh, explanations and different clarifications can clarify our um, meditative experience and lead to our realization? <clears throat> As people should be aware by now, uh, there's uh, the right that's based on uh, division, but there's the samyak, the, the right, um, like we say right speech and right view, there's the complete or right way that uh, embraces uh, and harmonizes the views. So as we progress um, in this uh, program, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to say how the views harmonize unless you know what the views are, right? It doesn't make sense to just say they're all going the same path unless you know they're, they are leading different paths to the same summit. So that's my aspiration for of folks that are reading the text that you actually struggle with them, which I know you are if you're actually reading them and see, does it apply to your experience? And could you explain it to others? Could you defend it with others? Could you defend it with yourself? <clears throat> so I find that um, my uh, viewpoint uh, is very syncretic, um, but that on a given day, um, I tend to be biased towards one viewpoint or another. So um, maybe when I ask people to do um, a paper, uh, I'm very interested in, uh, you know, why is that and how is it that we become interested or biased to one viewpoint or another, not just which one uh, is right or has to be right, but. Um, you know, why, why are we picking that one and what cause and conditions come together like that. <clears throat> so unfortunately I've heard we can't uh, hear from um, the audience other than people here in person. Is that can, still true? You can hear on my phone, Robert. So, okay, so that's good. And that volume's all, all up. Yeah, there we go jammed up, so uh, I'm interested in uh, getting some comments from people if they feel so inclined.
the nice thing about silence and the, and the Buddhist tradition is that uh, silence means assent. You believe you say, okay, I'm good with <laughs> what you said. So this is definitely the speak up tradition. So that's why uh, my teacher wanted to uh, name things uh, the lion's roar um, because uh, we, we can stay silent and say assent. And there is times where um, we need to be silent uh, in a conventional way. But the idea is that even when the Buddha was silent, um, he was unconventional silence and he'd make the lion's roar. Do you think that was possible? So I'm gonna assume that be, you're not just silent because you have nothing to say or you're not just silent because you're in conventional um, consciousness, but you're silent because you're making the lion's roar of silence, right? That it's deafening and the, the silence that started with Shakyamuni, um, you know, uh, closes the mouth of heretics and <laughs> destroys the, the, the ghouls and the, uh, and the other great beings from all the realms like that. <laughs> We've also been silenced by the lion's roar of silence and the Dada Buddha of the of the talk that we heard. Thank you. <laughs> or rather, I mean, of the 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 Buddha Dada of the talk that we didn't hear. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, it's not so. Yeah, I don't think you turned on the speaker there. So. Can you hear it now? Testing, testing. That's a little bit. Now that's better, right? Make a point or ask a question. Oh yeah, go. Seems like to me, some of these texts about the different philosophies are a little bit biased because they were written at a point in time and from a cultural perspective where it was a lot about debate and the precision of the debate given sort of the renaissance in India and so forth. And so it seems like it's sort of biased towards the Madhyamaka point of view. Um, and in that sense makes it sound like that point of view is the most superior, which of course I've bought into, so I don't mind, but it does seem like it's sort of biased without admitting that it's biased. Um, it's biased that it's admitting it's biased? No, it's biased um, and not admitting that it, it's biased. It's just biased yet acting like it's superior. Um, well, uh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, what's interesting about what uh, evolved in late India and um, the Himalayan regions, Tibet, you know, um, is uh, the attempt to have a syncretic approach, but at the same time, a hierarchical one. So uh, there would be uh, views that were more fundamental uh, that uh, took less um, special investigation. And then there were uh, superior views that uh, could only come about uh, through uh, deep investigation. So as I mentioned early on, um, the majority, I believe the majority of uh, Dharma practice and Buddha Dharma uh, says that uh, uh, things don't actually exist as they appear to be, um, but that to verify and uh, live that truth, it's necessary to develop uh, special states of consciousness. Um, although there, there is a strong strain in Buddhism uh, continuing up uh, in America with um, you know scholars like Stephen Batchelor, for example, that. Um, you know, try to make the point that actually everything the Buddha said was non-metaphysical and um, uh, just used common sense like that. So um, 
I respect its views, but uh, uh, you know, I I think uh, uh, he's probably read <laughs> as, little, as a Derek, but probably read a little bit too much, you know, British philosophy. So uh, uh, the ordinary um, the ordinary uh, world that the Oxford Dons are talking about is not the ordinary world of the cab driver in London. <clears throat> But uh, in the Tibetan system, uh, there's uh, an attempt to be both comprehensive and hierarchical at the same time. The comprehensiveness is that uh, we want to address and uh, investigate all aspects of experience, but at the same time, uh, we also want to establish uh, the most subtle and deepest nature of our reality and experience. And for that, it does take um, uh, special effort and special training. It's kind of a tricky balance a little bit, isn't it? You know? So what, we're, what teachers are saying a lot and philosophic texts are saying is like, you know, what you're saying is true, but it's not um, the deepest truth or it's not ultimately true. So uh, we're not saying you're completely false in most cases, but um, you haven't seen the whole picture like that. Lama, I think that it's uh, tricky, but I think you've given uh, the key to dealing with it uh, in your description of how you read. Uh -huh. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you saying that. You know, it's, uh, um, uh, it has to be some kind of a dialogue between uh, uh, our experience and then how things must be. It's very weird. <clears throat> So I think uh, I'm looking down at uh, Dana's phone where I probably should be looking at the uh, camera. <clears throat> I'm very interested in language. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, caught my interest um, uh, when I was young, uh, I don't think I was too old when uh, the play and the movie, The Miracle Worker came out about Helen Keller. Uh, maybe I have other people that are old enough to remember that, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so uh, there was an interesting scene in the movie um, at the uh, water pump at the well where um, uh, Annie was doing the braille on her hand and there was uh, an insight by Helen about the, ref the connection between uh, language and uh, the experience of the water. Whereas before, uh, there was not, uh, they couldn't make the connection. Maybe I'm not telling it as well as others could, but uh, what happened in her experience where suddenly she understood the, uh, the connection between um, the uh, braille or the word and uh, the experience and she could learn how to use language uh, even though uh, she could not really speak or hear. That's quite amazing, don't you think? <clears throat> so I've always been interested in speech therapy and uh, the power of words and uh, I've always been interested in uh, the strange languages like Sanskrit that claim to uh, have uh, power in the pronunciation and power in the words like that. <clears throat> I hope I'm not misrepresenting what you were thinking, Dirk. I'm just elaborating. Uh, no, you're not misrepresenting what I said, but you are talking about something slightly different, I think. <laughs> yes, like, yes I'm just, I'm, this is like, I feel like I'm in a little jazz concert and I'm just riffing, you know like that. So this is Yogi Shop Talk, which is the best kind, actually. I don't know who else is in on the call because I can only see like uh, two faces or three faces. So 
if there's anybody else that wants to um, speak up. <clears throat> uh, it's Jack. Yeah. Um, Hi. 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 So yeah, kind of on the riffing thing and um, the Helen Keller thing kind of reminded me of in the book that we're reading, um, one of the key differences they talk about in the beginning um, is the way the approach for the opponent, like thinking about how are we going to change the opponent's mind? How are we going to get mm. this person to understand what I'm trying to say? And um, I thought that was interesting that, okay, well, one of the main differences is how we approach how the other person thinks. And um, I really like that because we're thinking about other people rather than just trying to you know, win. We're thinking about, well, what will get this person to understand? Um, so I just thought that was cool. It is cool. <laughs> You're right. Uh, I use, uh, uh, you know, this alternating, uh, you know, uh, non-linear uh, uh, meditation and with doing linear study, um, but also I do alternate it with um, uh, poetry or evocative speech. So. Uh, when we move into talking more about uh, Tantra, um, it's important to look and investigate that use of language too, you know? Um, right now we're looking at how would we explain the experience to ourselves and to others and how would we uh, verify experience to ourselves and others and how to do that practice. And I've been suggesting that um, in try instead of trying to um, melted into kind of a, a oneness, uh, think of uh, alternating it, you know, like that. Um, alternating doesn't mean dualistic. We have two legs that we alternate. Uh, we don't have to hop. So uh, alternating is not dualistic actually. <clears throat> so um, the convincing others with my own world is, uh, the strongest I use working with others is trying to help people um, overcome, uh, of course, addictions to who we think we are, right? That's the big Dharma thing, <laughs> who we think others are. We have an addiction to who we think we are, who we think others are. But on a practical level, uh, dealing with folks that are uh, addicted to substances and uh, folks that are suicidal, right? So um, it's one thing to talk about someone's liberation and say, you know, this will help towards your liberation. But if someone is um, very close to um, hurting themselves or killing themselves or hurting others, then we have to really um, have speech that is not only evocative in a poetry way, but, but makes sense, right? And that is also consistent with our personal experience, you know? So, um, that's why uh, you know it's important and useful to uh, have therapy license um, because uh, people come in with raw experience and you have to use your uh, all your skills as uh, Dana knows like uh, just because we present a truth to somebody doesn't mean they immediately uh, take it do they we have to be flexible and um, uh, there really are real stakes, right? We're not here to decide what position is proper. Uh, we don't really care about being right. <laughs> we just, we really want people to, um, you know, uh, stop harming themselves and, uh, and stay on the planet long enough to figure out what's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> like some students you know with their main way to realize this, this truth of uh, the way things are it's a possible like but some students you know they're you know they're not they're, they're not like 
intellectual, for example, but yet, you know, they um, just have moments, maybe through poetry, for example, or music, where they, they, things start to uh, just have a shift in their perspective. And they may not necessarily uh, able to read those that <laughs> scholarly books mm. very easily. It just might get a little bit lost in foggy, whereas on the other hand, if they read, you know, um, just, you know, teachers that, or even listening to you, mm. just listening to you, just, that, that, that can strike something within them that they might not be able to, because the way their mind works, grasp, you're reading these amazing texts that are, you know, mm. that another person <clears throat> might find and moves them in or reveals to them these truths. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people can hear me because of this microphone. Are you, I'm not sure. Patty was asking, like, uh, okay. what, what, what? Pardon me? Oh, okay. So um, if you're not uh, um, into the geekiness of uh, <laughs> things like this, or maybe if you're not philosophically oriented or Maybe uh, if you're not that smart or something, uh, um, how much does that matter? Um, uh, these texts uh, in what we're talking about um, actually uh, isn't just appealing to um, you know conventional mind, right? Um, so that's. Uh, uh, interesting so um, if we approach it just like we have to be conventionally intelligent uh, and have a high IQ that then um, we're not approaching it correctly so uh, the actual way that we approach these Mahayana texts and of course later Tantras uh, is uh, we have to approach it on a different level so even though it appears that we're talking about um, things that seem kind of geeky or obtruse, um, uh, we're, we're approaching it from a more subtle mind than the normal mind that says uh, our conventional name or job or IQ, something like that. So this is important to point out, you know, because Western Buddhology or Western uh, academic traditions um, approach uh, the text from uh, what I earlier called, uh, you know, kind of um, British ordinary empiricism approach. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I don't think they're meant to be approached from that level like that. Um, so uh, without doing uh, some kind of uh, uh, meditations uh, that uh, help us see things from a different perspective than um, uh, they, they don't make sense, right? So um, when you're reading the text, you know, the, um, that we're you know, going over with all of the program, uh, just forget that, uh, you know, the name on your driver's license uh, forget that you're, you know, in a certain house <laughs> with their address or something like that. So uh, you want to approach them from a certain view like that. <clears throat> it, it's very strange, but um, usually in the West, they don't point that out. <clears throat> so when... Um, I've been around fantastic teachers, which I've had the good karma, then, uh, you know, even though there's talking stuff that I have no idea on, uh, something's getting through. It's quite mystical, magical. Um, so it, it does make a difference also who's speaking the words. Of course, the words can be true in any case on a certain level, but um, uh, as I've said, if we just hear the words, I love you, just as a meaning, uh, it's gonna have uh, one impact, but uh, 
if we're at the right place in the right time with the right person, then uh, you know it has uh, an, an electrical effect, right? Like that. So um, uh, you know, one reason uh, I like to think that uh, I've gotten so much support in doing this program from uh, uh, my teachers and friends um, is that I've wanted everybody to be a, a practitioner, to have taken refuge and, you know, commit the, you know, commit themselves to it and commit to a meditation practice. So it's not merely an academic uh, approach, even though it seems like we get pretty geeky at times. Um, so uh, the, the Buddha mind, the Buddha nature, um, can um, do a lot of complex things that our conventional uh, surface mind can't do, so like that. Does that sound mystical? I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, because you've said that before, and I, and I forget, so I need you to say it over and over. Yeah, to like that. Text from that mind. You've said that many times. Yeah. And I, let, and I, I have a... I go back to this other way of thinking yeah. that you've said repeatedly, no, you need to read these texts from this other place. So thank you for saying reminding us. Again. So as we know, um, children learn to pick up language where they previously hadn't had language, right? So they, uh, they, we don't do language by just pointing out things. That's the floor, that's the box, that's cat. Um, they learn language. Um, uh, and abstract concepts and relational concepts uh, right from the very start, don't they? Yeah, that's, that's so true. Yeah, so um, that's quite interesting because we would think like little kids would only learn kind of uh, concrete realist um, uh, correspondence kind of language, right? <clears throat> so uh, one thing that I think the prasangikas are uh, intent on is uh, refuting this kind of ordinary language idea, right? So, um, you know, they, they are kind of uh, stodgy in a certain way, but uh, they want to keep on saying, no, language is not uh, based on um, a naive realist view where uh, the word has to correspond uh, to an object on a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? So, um, this, uh, this isn't how language works at all, um, but it, it seems on ordinary life it does, right? We have a one-to-one -one correspondence, like uh, when you say the word I, it has to correspond to some entity, or we say uh, love, it has to correspond immediately to some feeling, right? But, um, uh, you know, I had the happiness to uh, do my senior thesis at Middlebury in Wittgenstein and Norga Juna, and they have come at it from similar points of view that language doesn't exist through correspondence at all, that uh, it's a language game. So I can't help but reading Prasangika through um, my, of course, my own Western biases. Uh, so when uh, it's translated in English as imputed, I see it saying like, don't forget it's a language game like that. And kids are really good at games. So, uh, and I'm very interested in game theory. So as uh, some people know, at one point my therapy practice was almost half with people with uh, developmental disabilities and IQs of 70 and under, right? who, by the way, would also have mental illness and physical problems, right? But um, could, through the use of games and uh, kind of game theory, uh, you know, uh, come to concepts and understandings about uh, really difficult problems. Yes? What's the basis of game theory? Oh, God, game theory. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, that's a whole like separate thing, but um, uh, without giving kind of scholarly thing, uh, I would explore how 
um, we we play like kids play hide and seek, you know, or um, you know, how do you make this agreement? And then it's fun to hide, and then I'll go seek, and then I count to ten or something, and then or how do we play bombardment or something? What what kind of uh, you know uh, uh, semi duality do we have to set up to have a game? And what's you know like that? So uh, we can talk more about game theory later and how we do games, but. Uh, it's one interesting way people have even applied it to economics like that. Lama, I think it's interesting that uh, the one-to-one -one correspondence or penchant for that one-to-one -one correspondence even extends to doing things like creating a concept called nothing and then actually having some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence with something that we made up that doesn't exist at all. Yes, exactly. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm very interested in uh, uh, how we use uh, non-correspondence, non-referential language that um, is at the same time uh, uh, evocative and, and logically sound, you know, um, and, and that's why, you know, uh, you know, it's very interesting to uh, read uh, the, you know, poetic works of like Shabkar, right? Uh, but it's also interesting to read um, some of the songs, um, devotional songs by Sankapa and, and of course, uh, uh, Mipam Ripshe that are evocative and poetic and logical uh, and weird at the same time. So I like that. <laughs> so we'll have to talk about game theory or, or I'll get going and then we'll never stop. And I said, I'd be home before too long. <laughs> but doesn't everybody like games, you know? Don't we like to like, like winning? Yeah, well, that's it. Dana said she likes winning. So she's, that's a game. That's a game theory. You immediately say win, winning, you know? Like losing, you don't like losing, like winning. So, um, that's the fundamental uh, game theory uh, like that. So, uh, you know, that's an interesting part. Can you have a game where like in the 60s, 70s, you know, everybody wins, you know? Like, can you, is that really a, that fun a game? That's unlikely. To play like everybody wins, <laughs> like yes. everybody wins, yeah, that's so, fun. yeah. <laughs> okay, good. They, they, so, do they do have fun. Okay, silly. yeah, it's silly. So, a cooperative, a cooperative game. Yeah. Okay, so um, we we can close up here. Uh, I'll put something together about uh, language and reality and meditation, and um, you know, see what we come up with. Um, but the primacy of uh, our Dharma experience um, must be, from my point of view, on uh, the meditative experience that uh, examines our awareness directly, right? Um, I do believe that it's very helpful to do reading and study, um, but even the reading and study has to be approached from uh, the um, point of view of uh, examining the nature of awareness itself, right? So I definitely have a bias there, don't you think? Don't you think so? <clears throat> so uh, sh how should we do like closing prayers? Should I just do them? Because I've got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I just can't. Uh, I can't, I just can't say my own oh. uh, long life prayer. That's uh, déclassé. Oh, so. say it well. <laughs> Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of the Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. 
In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good, all powerful Chenrezig, Tenzin Gatso. Please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may fill all their temporary and ultimate goals. So song magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones. Merciful giver of the stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. I will look at us for our great treasure of optical compassion. My dear master of all this wisdom, Pleasure upon the stir of the entire Hosanaras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowman sages, of the sun drakpa, of your request at your holy feet. So thank you, everybody. He's tuned in and hung in. So uh, this is a good trial run for um, this coming Sunday, like that. So I think we should do like a bit of a test, uh, maybe every day, what do you think, like that. Um, <laughs> so maybe tomorrow we can get together and try again so uh, happy summer i hope people had a good summer solstice and now we're definitely into summer wouldn't you say <laughs> like that oh my <laughs> bye <laughs> thanks thank you lama bye bye yeah, thank you. Well, and, yeah. And thanks dana for uh yeah. fixing it yeah thank you yeah and, and thanks connor for putting it together absolutely absolutely see you guys bye i don't know how to turn off here leave there we go